we've been talking about internal combustion engines and we've introduced the Otto cycle. The Otto cycle is visually shown right here, starting at state one. It's at bottom dead center going to state two. It's a compression stroke, adiabatic compression. Then from two to three, you have constant volume heat addition. Then three to four, you have adiabatic expansion. And four back to one, this is the same. Four back to one is constant volume heat rejection. What's the strategy when given a problem? You want to get a table of the properties, especially state one, state two, state three, state four, the pressure in maybe kilopascal or bar, and the temperature maybe Kelvin or degree C. You could also put the specific volume, meters cubed per kilogram. And then you apply the first law, the second law, the third law. No, 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 I'm doing this. Just the first law, the second law. We haven't got to the third law yet, right? For the process. This is what the first law looks like for each of the processes, one to two. The second law for the process, one to two. First law, two to three. Second law, two to three, etc. Which of those Q's are zero? Which of the works are zero? Right. And so from the first law, we find that the work, one to two, is equal to the negative, the change in internal energy. True or false? True. That's exactly true. All right. Let's take a look at the second law. Why are all the entropy generations for each of the processes zero? internally reversible. And then it's adiabatic, adiabatic. Hence, for a process one to two, S is constant, isentropic, isentropic. So the process one to two is isentropic. What other process is isentropic in the cycle? Three to four, true. Three to four is isentropic. So, hmm. Uh, at this point, I'm going to say, if you wanted to calculate the change in the internal energy, I would like to know the temperature at state 2 and the temperature at state 1. And if I knew the temperature at state 2 and the temperature at state 1, and I could get the change in U by multiplying the delta T by a property known as? What is this property, CV? Specific heat, a constant volume. True? So the game is to uh, get the temperatures and then use that to get the works and the heat transfers and then make some computations about the cycle. So a question I have is, I just wrote the equation where we use this property known as C sub V. The name of it is the specific heat at constant volume. So the question is, is the specific heat at constant volume restricted to be used only for constant volume processes. So we'll take your votes now. I just turned it on. Yes, answer A. No, answer B. This is for an ideal gas. This is for an ideal gas, all right? And here we go. So a lot of us said, yes, it is restricted. OK. Let me ask this question. Uh, let me do this. Let me select the right answer and then get out of there. Um, work. We're going to use this equation to calculate work 1 to 2. It came from the first law, right? Yeah, there's C sub V delta T for, OK. So let me ask you this. Was the process one to two constant volume? Adiabatic compression, was it constant volume? <laughs> it's not constant volume, it's compression. The volume changes, right? And yet here we have, uh, I'm using C sub E and it's for a non-constant volume process. That really appears to be a uh, conundrum. Uh, I, I don't understand that, Professor. Can you explain it to me? 
All I can say is it's a property we're interested in. The definition of CV is the rate in general, the rate of change of U with respect to temperature holding volume constant. When you have an ideal gas, that partial derivative becomes an ordinary derivative because U is a function of T only. And so now it's just the how ch U changes with respect to T regardless if it's constant volume because it's an ideal gas. So if I want to get the change in internal energy for an ideal gas, C sub E delta T. Does that help? Let's ask another clicker question. I'll change it up. I'll say not change constant volume, I'll say constant pressure, P. Everybody heard of C sub P? Specific heat, constant pressure. For an ideal gas, is the specific heat at constant pressure, C sub P, restricted to be used only for constant pressure <coughs> processes? I turn it on, answer yes or no. About five more seconds. We'll go ahead and stop. Here we go, stopping. And we show the results. True. So for an ideal gas, first of all, for an ideal gas, there's three things you remember. What are those three things? That. That, that, please explain what this means. The internal energy of an ideal gas is only a function of temperature, where before we needed two independent intensive properties to tell another property. Like for steam, I, I can't just say, this is the temperature of the steam, go get me the internal energy. Or refrigerant, I have to have two independent intensive properties. But for ideal gas, air, behaves as an ideal gas, one of the most common ideal gases we deal with. For an ideal gas, U is a function of temperature only. I can repeat that till I'm dead. It's hard concept, okay? All right. What about this concept? H, enthalpy is a function of temperature only. If you believe U is a function of temperature only, it's easy to go here because H is defined as, no, regardless of the substance, U plus PV, true or false? regardless of the substance. Now, if it's an ideal gas, hey, PV, I think I can replace that by RT. True for an ideal gas, for an ideal gas. Now, uh, what about this R? Is that a function of pressure? Is that a function of temperature? Is that a function of anything? It's a constant, ideal gas constant. The name of it gives it away. <laughs> The ideal gas constant. And what about T? Uh, is that a function of temperature? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, function. How about a function of pressure? No, it's T. It's, it's not a function of volume either or, or time of day. It's only a function of temperature. So this is a function of temperature plus another function of temperature. You get H as a function of temperature only. Let's move on. So we're interested in calculating the cycle thermal efficiency, maybe a symbol like that, eta, thermal efficiency. It'll be the work net out of the cycle divided by the Q that comes into the cycle. Where does the Q come into the cycle for the auto cycle? For, is it, here I'll ask a quicker question, Q in, is it uh, Q1 to 2, Q2 to 3, Q3 to 4, Q4 to 1, answer A, B, C, or D? I turn it on and I'll collect your answers. Q in. Which one is it? 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 1. We have to stop at 30 seconds. So. All right, we'll go ahead and stop. And we show it. And this was the process adiabatic. Then it constant volume heat addition. Constant volume heat addition, true? All right. Uh, professor, 
I think uh, this equation's in error. Can I replace QN by Q net? True or false? Somebody says, I, can re I would like to replace QN by Q net. You say, yes, you could do it. It's true. No problem. Or, no, that will be an error. Don't do it. False. Your answer. Couple more seconds and then we're done. There we go. All right. So, you cannot replace Q in by Q net. They are not the same. If you did replace Q in by Q net, what would the thermal efficiency be every day for that cycle? It would be one because Q in is equal to Q net for not just the auto cycle, but the diesel cycle, the Brayton cycle, all cycles, true? Yeah, true. So this is no good. We'll leave it as, as, as we had it there. The next uh, metric that you would often report, not as often as the thermal efficiency of the cycle, but what's the mean effective pressure, MEP? The mean effective pressure. Well, the mean effective pressure is defined as the net work of the cycle divided by the displacement volume. Displacement volume. Now, I'd like the displacement volume on a per unit mass basis. So let me ask this. Uh, um, is this displacement volume equal to V1 minus V2, V2 minus V3, or V4 minus V2, uh, A, B, or C? Okay. So what is, what is that displacement volume equal to? V1 minus V2, you know, which one is it? All right, just two answers then. Pick from two. Yeah, when you make them on the fly, sometimes you get a little garbled up. All right, we're done. Let's, uh, it, it will show the results. So very good. Displacement volume is that volume at bottom dead minus the volume at top dead in per unit mass basis. There it is. So this is going to be uh, V1 minus V2, which some other people already picked out. It's like uh, that volume at top, isn't that V4 as well? V1 and V4, is that the same? And then isn't this V3? So here you go. So here's another clicker question for you. The auto cycle, and I remind you the process one to two, et cetera. Where is the maximum, maximum pressure? I'll start it right there. So now where is the maximum pressure? Is it at state one? Is it at state two, state three, state four, or none of the above? The maximum pressure. None of the above means maybe I can't tell or more information's needed. Like for this problem, it could be there, and that problem, it could be there, whatever. You know, it's so for the pressure, where is the maximum pressure of the cycle, the auto cycle? Let's go ahead and stop. Let's show the results. So a lot of us say it's at state three, right? Where is state three? At the beginning or the end of combustion? Con yeah, at the end of it, at the end of the constant volume heat addition. That was very good. Let's do this one. Where is the maximum temperature of the auto cycle to be found? Maximum temperature. We got a couple more seconds. Do we stop and show? And show. So uh, congratulations to the 96%, right? So it's at the end of the heat addition at constant volume. That's your maximum temperature. Same slide over here on this side, but where, which states have the same, um, let's say, entropy? Which states have the same entropy? 
either states one and three, two and three, three and four, or two and four. Maybe I should put E, none, right? None of the above. If you like E, you can vote for E now. Yeah, we show the result. So a lot of people said the process three and four. How did you determine that? Yeah. Now there's another isentropic process. Which one was it? One to two, and your eyes said, hey, where's one to two? Where's one to two, right? And it wasn't to be found. So, Okay, uh, how about this one? Uh, which have the same uh, volume? Which ones have the same volume? State one and three, two and three, three and four, two and four. I think we're pretty well there. I'll stop it at 30 seconds. And we'll go ahead and stop and show the results. And so the process between 2 and 3, 2 to 3 was constant volume heat addition. True? So here we go. Uh, for an ideal gas that undergoes an isotropic process, assuming constant specific heats, uh, you can uh, evaluate the change in entropy using this equation and then also for an ideal gas we recall that R is equal to the difference of specific heats. Do you recall that relationship? Yes? No? Actually it's not that hard to re-derive. Did you like the equation that, uh, that uh, uh, H is equal to U plus PV? True. Um, this one, H, is proportional to uh, C sub P uh, DT, something like that, right? Or T, C sub P T. What is U, C sub V T? True. What about PV? Uh, RT? Cancel the T's, and you get that R is equal to C sub P minus C sub V. It's just, that's a very quick derivation, but it reestablishes that fact. So what I can do is I can uh, stick it in here, and then I manipulate that equation for isentropic process. I'll have C sub P natural log of T2 over T1 equal to C sub P minus C sub V natural log of P2 over P1. Follow the algebra. Divide over by C sub P and you'll get that natural log of T2 over T1 is equal to, then we'll also use the rule that A natural log of X is equal to the natural log of X to the power A, true or false? Yep. And so what we'll have is we'll have the natural log of P2 divided by P1 all to the power, and then you'll have um, K minus 1 over K, where K was defined as C sub P over C sub V. What do I do with both sides of that expression? Exponentiate, and you get that T2 over T1 is equal to P2 over P1 to the K minus 1 over K. Look at this right here. What did we just redrive? What was derived in previous chapter 6 when you studied entropy? There's a lot of restrictions on this equation. Some students love this equation so much they'll apply it to steam in the subcooled liquid region. They'll apply it to steam in the two-phase region. Can you do that? No. You can only apply it for ideal gas. You can only apply it for an ideal gas undergoing a isentropic process. And you have assumed implicitly that constant specific heats. We're not accounting for variable specific heats. It's a great expression. Professor, do I have that equation available to me during exams on equation sheet? Yes, you do. You could do a similar derivation starting here, and you'll get that equation, as well as rederive this equation. So all three of those equations are handy. Now, we're going to use this equation a lot right here because in auto cycle, we have a compression ratio. And if you're going from state one to state two, state one at bottom dead, state two at top dead center, 
then this V1 divided by V2 is the compression ratio, R. And so if I wanted to find the temperature at the end of the compression stroke, it was isentropic compression, I would need to know the temperature at the beginning of the compression stroke, the compression ratio, and assuming constant specific heats, uh, get that K for the ratio of specific heats. If you're working with air, what is K numerically? 1.4, 1.4. Diatomic gas is 1.4. All right? Okay. Uh, so you want to find K at around 300 Kelvin. There it is, 1.4 for air, true, out of the table in appendix. If you wanted to say, I want to do a better job, I want to be a little more accurate, but I don't want to go to the variable specific heats, tables, I may think, okay, well, it starts maybe at 300. It ends maybe at 700. Uh, there's an average temperature of 500 for the process. Why don't I evaluate K and specific heats at 500, the average temperature? Good idea, and it will improve. So right here, you may want to go and get a 1.387 instead of a 1.400. Okay. Somebody says, oh, I don't know why, but we have nitrogen, pure nitrogen in our problem. There you go. Or I have pure carbon dioxide or pure carbon monoxide or pure whatever hydrogen. There's some other properties where you can get the constant specific heat as a function of temperature for different gases. Now, Professor, what about this table, table A22? My recommendation is don't use it. Am I, is that pretty blunt and clear? How many people you think on a final exam will be in frogging around with table A22 on my final exam when I'm grading it. A few, a handful. Then I repeat, don't use it. Why? First of all, people don't really understand it. Tell me what PR and VR is. Second, they think it gives them an added degree of uh, accuracy. It really doesn't. <laughs> okay? So it masks the physics of what's going on. It's just more jumping around in tables and interpolating and it takes more time if you need to interpolate. Do you have a lot of time on exams? Nope. So it's constant specific heats. It'll do you. I haven't had a problem on a, an exam or final exam in the last number, I don't know how many years, where I needed a student to account for variable specific heat. You can stay completely out of this table. Professor, some of the solutions for the homework problems use this table. Good. Solve it with constant specific heats and see how close you are. You'll be pretty close. All right? All right. Any questions about that? Do I need to be more blunt? Should I practice using any information in this table? No. Okay. Also, you can work out analytically the thermal efficiency of the auto cycle. So I publish this. I'm running a little bit out of time this semester. I have more clicker questions going a little slower over here, but... The derivation is not hard. And you can develop that the thermal efficiency is equal to 1 minus 1 over R. I forgot, what is R? Compression ratio to the K minus 1. What is this K right there? K minus 1K is the C sub P over C sub B, about 1.4 for air, cold air. So please take a look at that, and it'll, uh, there's a problem in the textbook as well. And maybe. Uh, other people have developed or shown the detailed blow-by-blow -blow, uh, derivation. It takes around seven minutes to do that. So when you're given a problem for the auto cycle, the typical thing is they give you the initial pressure and initial temperature at the start, state one, at the start of the compression stroke. They tell you the compression ratio. They then tell you afterwards what is the maximum temperature that the heat after you've added the heat, what is the maximum temperature? So that temperature is state three, state three. So they, if you wanted to, you could put state one, state two, state three, state four. You could put pressure, you could put temperature. They give you this pressure and temperature, typically. They give you this temperature. How do you get to T2? The expression we just showed. Isentropic compression. How about P2? There's a couple ways, but you can use the analytic expression similar to the one used to get T2. 
Or you could just say, hmm, uh, I know the specific volumes and I know V1, I can calculate V1. Is that R T1 over P1? Ideal gas always isn't V1 that. And V2, is that going to be V1 divided by R using the compression ratio? Now that if I really just get T2 and V2, I can get P2 using that way. So it's, it's kind of like I can go this way or this way to get P2. Either one works, and both should give you the same number to a lot of digits on your calculator. How about uh, this pressure, P3? Well, you've got V2 is equal to V3, right? Constant volume heat addition. You already got T3 given to you in a problem statement. Can I get P3? Let me write it here. Is P3 equal to R T3 divided by V3? Yes or no? Ideal gas equation. You jump between ideal gas equation and then some isentropic property, you know, relations for an ideal gas. Okay. All right. And then for four, what are you doing from four? Well, you're ex just like this was isentropic compression. This is isentropic expansion. Isentropic expansion to get to T4. What about V4? Is that equal to V1? Yep. And so I could get P4 knowing T4 and V4. True? Just like I did P2. P, uh, okay. So then I can plot and I go, okay, push, 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 push. That's what the process looks like on a PV diagram. And then what's the process look like or the cycle on a TS diagram? Once I have all of these pressures and temperatures, a good idea of the diagram, then I want to calculate the Q1 to 2, the Q2 to 3, the heat transfers for each of those processes, don't I? And I want to calculate the works for each of those processes, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, etc., and then calculate the Q net and the work net. See if they're the same. If they're not the same, look for my error. And then calculate the bottom line, something like the thermal efficiency and the back work rate, not the back work ratio, the mean effective pressure. Here's the solution to this problem on the next slide right here, and it's all done in Excel, and you can easily do it in Excel too. So what do I do? I put some information about, okay, compression ratio, specific heats. I, you know, do R, that's not R bar, it's just R, which is uh, 8.314 R bar divided by the motor mass of air, 28.97, right? Okay. Then I have K, then I have my states, and I fill up this little table, just like I spoke about. Then I have all my Qs and all my works, and I calculate them. How did I get this Q2 to 3? Is that C sub V T3 minus T2 from the first law? Yeah. How do I get this work 1 to 2? Is that C sub V T2 minus T1 with the minus sign in front of it from the first law? Yeah. Yeah. Notice that this is negative. Does that make sense that the work 1 to 2 is negative? It's compression work. Our system is the gas that's trapped, and it's being squeezed in the compression. So it's receiving work. Is it heat rejection is negative? The work of the cycle and the heat network, network and that heat transfer of the cycles match for the same magnitude. Then I can calculate the thermal efficiency. The efficiency, or A to TH, is equal to the work net divided by QN, which was the Q2 to 3, this number right there. True? All right, then something about, hey, you can use this equation. Oh, that equation was 1 minus 1 over R to the K minus 1. Same number. Different, almost looks completely like, how, how does this give you that? It, it works. And then you calculate the displacement volume on a per unit mass basis. 
What was that? That was a difference between V1 minus V2, V1 minus V2, and then mean effective pressure, the work net of the cycle divided by the displacement volume. Let's talk a little bit before we leave gasoline, I mean auto cycle, let's talk a little bit about gasoline. How many people ever bought gasoline? <laughs> But everybody's going up to one of these things, paid for gas, and used it. And you've had a choice. You've had a choice. You could buy less or more expensive gas, true? Well, what are you getting for the choice? If you pay more, what do you get? Higher octane number. So what's here, this number 93 versus 89 versus 87? It's your octane rating. And they'll show, if you look at it, it's got an R plus uh, M divided by 2. It's a research octane method to develop it in a motor octane, and then they combine it. So you can Google and find out, oh, this is a f uh, indicates the anti knock properties of the fuel. And it's based on a comparison with some standard uh, gasoline. Basically, if it's uh, pure octane, it'll have an octane number of 100. All right. You could buy over 100 octane, true? How many people ever go to the airport? Jet fuel, or not jet fuel, this high, oct high octane uh, piston gasoline, high compression ratio engine. So you could buy it over there. I don't know if anybody ever still does, but when I was young, people would do that. You know, Go fill up at the airport or somewhere, pay a lot of money. Anyway, um, and, because they had super high compression ratio engines. So this price difference is significant, is it not? Are you getting better miles per gallon for the better fuel? You know, it's a great misconception out there. That uh, is it nice to treat your car like you know treat your you know loved one Valentine's Day with this and that? You, is it better to treat your loved car with high octane every now and then? Not really. You're not buying it anything, okay? If your if your compression ratio is low enough <clears throat> that uh, it doesn't require the higher octane fuel, save the money, okay? So uh, what is knock? So it's basically combustion that's happening before you want it to happen. And often the combustion starts at the spark grate and as it's propagating very, very quickly to the other gas that's sitting down here that hasn't combusted yet, that other gas feels the almost instantaneous increase in pressure as it's coming at it, right? So the pressure of sound and the flame propagation are not the same speed, so it's being compressed, it's even getting hotter, and then it could hit the self-ignition temperature, and if there's a little carbon deposit somewhere, that could help it, and you get pinging. So, Typically, it starts where you have hotter surfaces, okay, somewhere in here. Uh, and then you have two uh, pressure pulses happening, and they hit in the smack, and it's not good. How do they stop it? They retard the timing. Uh, and you have a knock sensor in your engine. All engines since, I don't know, 1990-something has had knock sensors to help detect it before your ear can hear it, and then retard it to avoid it because it's damaging to your engine. Anybody owned a car that knocked and pinged like crazy when you came away from a red light and it turned green? I did. So it's really something that when you load the engine, it's more prevalent, not when it's unloaded. <laughs> okay, it's when you're loading it. So coming away from a red light and it starts to sound like people are smashing hammers on your engine, bang, 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 bang. right? Then you have to lay off and, and then fill up with more expensive fuel. Or simply never punch it. But if you have a high performance car, here's a BMW in the owner's manual, they say, hey, premium unleaded gas lead minimum 91 octane. So if you got enough money to buy a car like that, I think you got enough money to pay for the gas to go in it. <laughs> All right? So, so look in your user's manual. They'll have a, a minimum octane for it. Um, ready to move on for the diesel cycle? I didn't leave much time for it, did I? Well, in the diesel cycle, which process is different than in the auto cycle? First question. Which 
process is different than in the auto cycle. Diesel cycle, auto cycle. Is it process one to two? Two to three? Three to four? Or four to one? Everybody in? All right, let's go ahead and stop it and we'll show it. And that's very good. So the process from two to three is different. Okay, so what's the process from two to three that's different? It's a heat addition, but it's constant pressure. So when you plot the pressure volume diagram, you typically have a much higher compression ratio. It gets closer to the axis there, higher pressure at state two. Then you have constant pressure, heat addition to state three, and that's the big difference right there. And then you have isentropic expansion with constant volume, heat rejection. Okay. So what you want to be able to do is plot the cycle on a temperature entropy diagram and a pressure volume diagram. But let's analyze the difference in this two to three. Okay, is the work two to three equal to zero? No, it's not. And so is it integral of PDV from V2 to state three, from, from state two to state three? Is that how I would go back and say, I need to calculate that work, let's do an integral PDV? Yes, is that pressure constant during the constant pressure heat addition? Can I take it outside the integral? Is it then P times V3 minus V2? Yes. Yeah. And so what happens when you compress and then you expand, they usually tell you the cutoff ratio, V3 divided by V2. V3 is larger than V2. So they have a new parameter, not the compression ratio, the cutoff ratio. They still have the compression ratio from 1 to 2, and that's V3 over V2. Okay. So what I do is with this first law, I'll take the U3 minus U2 equal to Q2 to 3 minus the P3 V3 plus P2 V2. Did I put in that work expression correctly? And then I bring to this other side here. And then I bring to the other side here. And so what I'm left with is U3 plus P3V3 minus U2 plus P2V2 is equal to Q2 to 3. So what is this property? H3. What is this property? H2 is equal to Q2 to 3. So if I wanted to calculate Q2 to 3, how much heat is added? That's the only place heat is added in the cycle. It's equal to C sub P times T3 minus T2. Always a student studies auto, then they study diesel, and they notice that the only difference between Q2 to 3 auto and Q2 to 3 diesel is I have a CV there, T3 minus T2. And I'll get somebody to visit me and say, I just don't understand. Why do we have a CV for the auto and a CP for the diesel? One's constant volume heat addition, work out the algebra. And one's constant pressure heat addition, work out the algebra. It's related to a change in H instead of a change in U. Now, you have to do a little work to get the right volume for the expansion from 3 to 4. It's not as much of an isentropic expansion as you had an isentropic compression. Because the compression went all the way here from 1 to 2, but the expansion only goes isentropically from three to four. Two to three is still expansion, still work. Okay. Same strategy, solve the problem, set it up where you have a, a table of properties. You, typically this is given, this is given. Typically some other information is given. In this problem, the initial compression ratio is given and the cutoff ratio is given. Cutoff ratio. With that cutoff ratio, I can work out all these other temperatures and pressures. Then I say, give me each, for each of these processes, give me the Q and the work. Then I check the Q of the cycle with the work of the cycle, work net, Q net, make sure that they equal. If they don't equal, 
look for error. Then I calculate something like the thermal efficiency. Well, is the thermal efficiency still the net work of the cycle divided by QN? And the QN is Q2 to 3. Just like for the auto cycle, you can work an analytic expression for the thermal efficiency of the diesel cycle. The equation's in the textbook as well as on the equation sheet. If you plug it in for this problem, same answer, which is good confirmation. Good? All right. And then you can calculate the mean effective pressure for this problem as well. Okay. So please, we're done with auto and diesel. You need to solve a lot of problems if you haven't already. Next time, Brayton. Next time, Brayton cycle, okay? Thank you very much.